Um, I would love to begin by just inviting us to give homage and thanks to our ancestors. That's how we always start um, in our community. And if you're able and willing to stand and face the east, this is the Guinea. This is our ancestral homeland for many of us. I'm going to call in at this moment my Haitian lineage because, you know, you think about Toussaint Leverture, you think about Bukman, you think about Cecile Fatima. These are the people who faced down the French, the, the, French, the Napoleon's army. It was like the most powerful army in the entire world with nothing but machetes and fire and created the first free black republic and the first nation to outlaw slavery. Like those are some of my ancestors I want to call in because that's the force we need in this time. And I want to ask you in this moment to think of an ancestor, a powerful ancestor, who's paving the way for where you think we need to be going. Okay? And we are going to, I'm going to count to three, and we're going to call their names really strong to the east all at once, really loud and strong. So conjure up that name. One, two, three. Ashe. You may sit down. Thank you. I also want to give... Um, some more thanks, in addition to you all, in addition to our ancestors. I want to give thanks and praise to the first peoples of this land, um, who I understand to be the Anacostan and the Piscataway. Um, and I also want to give thanks and praise to the Mohican Nation, uh, upon whose territory I am privileged to work and learn and live. Um, I am not Mohican, so I'm enjoying settler privilege on that land. And we as a collective have really taken the time to get to know the Mohican community, including folks on the reservation to where they've been expelled um, in Wisconsin, and to figure out what solidarity can look like. And in the case of this nation, they've asked us about you know, cultural respect easements, meaning how do we grant access to our land for them to use, their land for them to use for ceremony, for hunting, right? Um, seed preservation, and also actually remittance of funds. And so we're in that conversation and really encourage folks to think about whose territory you're on and what are the ways that you can be in solidarity. And the last thank you I want to give is to my team uh, because the only way that I am not freezing my butt off right now trying to get like sheep paddocks set up is because Justin is getting some sheep paddocks set up and I can be here warm in like clean clothes with all of you. Um, and anything we're doing is of course done by a team. It wasn't Martin Luther King who like did the civil rights movement. It wasn't Vandana Shiva who did ecofeminism, right? So it's all of us, it's always our teams and I want to always bring, bring folks with me when I'm talking. So. There's a lot to cover if we're trying to be the Wendell Berry of our times. Um, <laughs> and I've got like 38 minutes or something, so we'll see what we can do. Uh, but I want to tell you a tiny bit about our farm. It's really not the main point of what I want to talk about, but just for context about why I care so deeply about these issues of land sovereignty and food justice and regenerative farming. Because for me personally, um, I have believed and known since I was pretty young, since I was 15, 16 years old, that if we were going to get free, we had to figure out how to feed ourselves as a community. You know, Fannie Lou Hamer probably said it better than any of us. She said, if you have 400 quarts of greens and gumbo soup canned for the winter, nobody can push you around or tell you what to do, right? If you have nothing canned for the winter, as soon as they close those supermarkets, you'll put down your voter registration paperwork, you'll put down your NAACP membership card, and you'll go begging to feed your children, right? Anybody would. And so if we're going to be free, we have to really figure out how we are going to feed our communities. And so when, Soul Fire, when we started Soul Fire Farm back in 2010, that was the idea. Like, we got these 80 acres of you know, rocky, degraded territory. How do we bring forth bounty of like, herbs and vegetables and uh, pastured meats and mushrooms and honey? How do we bring forth a bounty and do that in a sustainable, thoughtful, ecological way, but then get it to the people who need it most in our community? right? Um, my son hates when I show this picture, but I think he looks super cute. <laughs> right? He looks cute. <laughs> I keep telling him, like, everybody loves the picture. Um, so for nine years, we were doing a doorstep delivery CSA. We've switched our model a little bit. We're now distributing through a refugee center and a reentry program. But the basic idea is the same. Like, let's make sure that we are taking responsibility for feeding our com own community. So in addition to that, which takes a lot of time. Anyone who runs a, a real farm, you know that that's enough. But we run training programs that support the returning generation, the next generation of black and brown farmers. Uh, most, our most popular one is this week-long immersion where people come and live together, cook together, laugh and cry together, and learn about you know, soil science and marketing strategy and 
all that kind of stuff. So this is um, from one of those programs. We also offer a special certificate program you can add on in looking fly while hanging onions. So <laughs> sign up at soulfirefarm.org. You too can look this fly. And then the final thing that we're up to at Soul Fire is organizing because, you know, in some ways it's really cute if you know how to farm and like grow food for yourself. But fundamentally, if you can't access land or capital and the labor laws are stacked against you as a farm worker, um, you're not going to get that far in terms of fundamental change. And so we do a lot of organizing work as well. And black farmers have been organizing forever. I mean, you look at the civil rights movement was really built on the labor, the land, the armed protection, the bail money of black farmers. We wouldn't even have the Civil Rights Act if it wasn't for them. So we're building on that, working on, um, well, we, we work with Warren, uh, the Warren campaign and the Sanders campaign on their platforms for agriculture, working on changing the farm bill, working on a national reparations platform to give the lands back to indigenous people and also to black farmers who've been displaced, that kind of stuff. And this extends internationally. Uh, because our human-made borders actually are not that applicable when we're talking about climate and biodiversity and the future of humanity. Um, so we're rocking with uh, our sibling farms in Vieques, in Haiti, in Ghana, um, working on seed-saving projects, reforestation, and so forth. Whatever they want to do. We're not telling them what to do, mind you. Um, so that's like a little bit about us, just to give you a flavor of why I'm so passionate about this work. But I think what really unifies it is that Everything we do on the farm, everything we do in the community, we're trying to build upon the wisdom that's been handed down to us through our Afro-Indigenous lineage. Right? So our ancestors, literally, when they were faced with almost certain kidnapping and almost certain being forced into the bowels of slave ships, had an idea, which was to gather up okra, cowpea, millet, black rice, a goosey melon, molokia, and braid it into their hair. Like, stash away some seeds as insurance for the future. Now, if that's not audacious hope, I don't know what is, because I know I get down about a lot smaller things than being captured and put into a ship, and I'm not trying to think about seeds. And if they had that foresight and that belief in us, it always reminds me, like, who am I to give up on my own descendants? So my sister did this beautiful painting to honor that moment of the seed braid, honor that moment of us you know, get in the sorghum and millet in our hair. And with it, not just the physical seed, but also the stories that come with the seed. Because braiding takes a little bit of time. And while you're sitting between your auntie's knees and trying not to flinch too much, she's telling you songs and stories and rememberings of who you are. And what I want to talk to you about today is really what are some of those rememberings as it relates to farming. Consider for a moment black agrarian practices. What I want you to think about is how many specifically African farming technologies do you use on your farm? And there's some hints up here. Like maybe you use something related to the type of crops you grow, or maybe it's something related to how you financed your farm, or how you take care of your soil, whatnot. But I want you to think about it, and then use your fingers and put up how many African farming practices you think you use on your farm? You can put, if you don't know, you can just be like, I don't know. 10 or more, 10, a lot of I don't know or I'm too shy, 6, <laughs> 10, 10, 10, 10 back there, <laughs> 5, okay, that's good. I appreciate honesty too, it's like fine, if you're like, if you already know it all, you might as well just be doing something else right now. So. Uh, <laughs> So we use a lot of, um, on our farm, a lot of Afro-Indigenous farming practices. And um, I just want to show you this comparative picture right here, because in my left hand is the soil as we found it back in 2006 when we signed white man's papers. Uh, we bought our land from uh, a logger who had been just taking out the trees, scraping the topsoil off. It was just pretty degraded. In my right hand is 2019. Same place, right? And so how do we do that? Well, I'm going to tell you what some of those practices are. Does anyone here either use worms actively to make compost or do things to encourage worms on your farm? OK, excellent. So vermicomposting. The first documented incidence of vermicomposting was in 
between 69 and 20 BCE with Cleopatra. So Cleopatra actually put out a law, a decree that said, if you harm an earthworm, you will be put to death. <laughs> now, mind you, I'm not really down with the death penalty, but I think that's pretty amazing that she saw how important worms were to the fertility of the Nile River Valley, that she actually had a cadre of priests who were dedicated to protecting the worm, studying the worm, and augmenting its habitat. In 1949, USDA scientists went, took some soil cores, and they were like, wow, during that era, the worm castings were 10 times what they were in Europe or the Americas, right, at present time. So she was actively sheet vermicomposting the entire like empire, right? Does anyone here compost? Just regular composting. Okay, me too. I hope you all compost. So obviously composting evolved simultaneously in many areas of the world, but this particular type of compost is called African dark earth. It is a mixture of bone char, uh, residue from making palm oil and soaps, uh, residue from the kitchen, residue from the farm, um, and offal, like the insides of animals that have been slaughtered. And it's combined in a certain way, makes this super duper black, carbon rich earth. And it's considered incumbent upon every generation to add a few inches of this earth to the farms so that you can, just like you read the rings of a tree to determine how old the tree is, you can determine how old these communities are in Ghana and Liberia by the rings of this super black compost. Imagine, like imagine if right here you could take a soil core and be like, oh yeah, this community is 700 years old because everybody put an inch. That would be amazing. Does anyone here do crop rotation? Crop rotation, we're learning, okay. When you see this picture, what do you see? Look like something? Slash and burn? Fire? Uh -huh. Harm, exactly. So I, I was in environmental science and biology double major in college, so I learned all about slash and burn. It's really bad. It's like what these backwards people around the world do, and they don't know how to take care of the land. What I didn't know at the time, and they didn't teach me in college, is that the original slash and burn is actually called Swidden agriculture. And it's when you do use fire to clear an area and liberate the nutrients. And after a couple years of farming there, you move to a new area. But you don't make it back to where you started for 20 to 30 years, a whole generation. And by that time, what has grown? A forest. A forest. A forest as a cover crop. And forests have very, very deep roots, and so they're able to pull up subsoil nutrients, deposit them back on top, releasing those minerals, right? Sweden agriculture, properly practiced, sequesters at least 100,000 pounds of carbon per acre. Net, right, even with the burning. The problem is when you steal land from indigenous people, which is what happened all around the world, that rotation, which could be 20 to 30 years, becomes 10 and then 5 and then 3. That's not sustainable because all you're going to get is just a little bit of grass and shrubs growing up and you're taking more from the land than you're giving back. But this is the OG crop rotation and the cover crop is the forest. And that is the most sustainable cover crop is the forest. Anyone ever hear of permaculture before? All right, I'm going to say something unpopular. Permaculture is a construct. <laughs> it's not really a real thing. Permaculture is mostly uh, college-educated, European-descendant men taking a little bit here and there from different indigenous communities around the world without crediting it, grouping it into a package, and selling it to you for only $5,000 for your certification. <laughs> I don't think that's really cool. I think if there's going to be royalties, they should go to the indigenous people who came up with these technologies. One example of the technologies is agroforestry, uh, which is, again, a broad category. But it has to do with the basic idea of like tree gills. Like you plant a fruit tree or a moringa tree right, or a, a fiber tree. And then around it, you have these perennial herbs that both attract pollinators, repel pests. And then around that, maybe you have a layer of annuals. Um, and the goats sort of come through, but they don't get too close because there's some cactus in between, right? It's this whole ecosystem. Um, in Haiti, we're very busy, you know, helping people uh, to restore a lot of their traditional polycultures. This is a nursery that our comrades in Leogan built after the earthquake um, with some resources that we supported the fundraising of. Um, in Nigeria alone, there's 26 examples of these, these polycultures, right, all around the world. Um, so if anyone does that, that's definitely a technology that we get to thank uh, indigenous people for, including African indigenous people. Another technology is terracing. 
Uh, in Kenya, it's called fanyaju, which means throw it upwards because soil goes down the hill over time. You want to build a terrace, you dig it and you throw it back up, right, and block it there. What's amazing about terracing or fanyaju is it takes whole areas of land that are not considered usable and makes them usable. You can't get a tractor on that, it'll like roll over, right, kill you. You don't want to do that. But you can build these staircases, stabilize them with, in our case, apple trees and lemon balm. In Haiti, you know, it's moringa and vetiver and broso, uh, locally adapted. Of course, there's the crops themselves that we use. Like a lot of things that we maybe don't realize are from the continent of Africa are like basil, many kinds of rice, gourds, melons, eggplants, black-eyed peas, sesame, uh, cola, as in Coca-Cola, the cola nut. Um, but it's not just the seeds that actually came from Africa that are relevant when we talk about African diasporic ag. We also think about enslaved Africans curating, developing, and plant breeding seeds that came from the Americas, Europe, and other places. So things like, you know, green glaze collards or moya mincing tomatoes and other things that True Love Seeds taught me about. Um, there's a lot of, of varieties that were cultivated by black farmers. Anyone here use a hoe? Really, there's farmers who don't use a hoe at all? Maybe you're not farmers. I was like, the hoe is like literally the most common, most versatile farming tool in the world. You can use it on the uplands, the dry lands, the lowlands, wet. You can primary tillage, secondary tillage, harvest. Like if you have one tool, there's a hoe, right? Um, I particularly, I prefer the, um, the African hoe or like the Caribbean hoe. It's like these eight pound like <laughs> hunks of metal that you can actually dig a hole with. And they don't sell them very much in the US. So whenever I travel, I like stuff my luggage on the way back with lots of, lots of heavy, sharp metal objects, um, <laughs> which makes me super popular um, with customs. It usually works out in the end. I just explain, I'm just a farmer. You understand? I'm not trying to kill anybody with all this stuff. <laughs> exactly. Does anybody transplant? Transplant. If you live in a cold climate like us, you almost can't grow anything unless you transplant. Again, first documented transplanting was the rice fields of the Mende and the Wolof in sub-Saharan Africa. And so they would, you know, start their rice in a concentrated area where they can give it lots of TLC, just like your greenhouse, extra water, protect it from pests, um, keep the goats out, whatever they need to do. And then when it's grown up a little bit, however many true leaves, right, then you move it out into the field. Um, the other early documented transplanting was the chinampas of the high, central Mexico. But it's a technology that we all use, or many of us use, but we don't often think about the origins in Afro-Indigenous and Turtle Island Indigenous communities. Livestock. Right? The oldest documented livestock, um, again, so comes from sub-Saharan Africa. It's a gallinaceous bird called the guinea fowl, or the guinea hen. Does anyone raise guinea hens? They are so loud. <laughs> I like, like them because of the heritage thing, but like, they are annoying too, but anyway, <laughs> guinea hens are the oldest documented livestock that we know about, domesticated livestock. The chickens are related um, to the guinea fowl, but black people and chickens also have a really close relationship. And that's because during enslavement in Virginia, it was actually illegal for black people to own livestock. And they listed out in the Virginia codes the types of livestock. No cattle, no horses, no pigs, no turkeys. Right, no donkeys. They listed all these things, but they didn't mention chickens because they thought oh, chickens is just, nah, it's like not really a big deal. Um, so black people became really, really good at raising chickens. That's all they they could raise, or we were allowed to raise, and developed all these varieties and techniques and um, pasture rot pasture rotation technology. So a lot of what we kind of inherit now is these like heirloom varieties, these neat varieties of chickens came through um, enslaved African farmers. How old do you think that tomato is? Nine months. Anyone else? Ten, two days, 10 weeks. You're all right. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so I'm really into food preservation. Where I live in upstate New York, you've got like five or six months of warm, and then the rest of the time you're eating out of the freezer or you know canned foods and things. So when I learned that this tomato was six months old, <laughs> and still fresh looking, and it tastes good apparently. I didn't actually taste it. Um, 
it was amazing to me. And many of our food preservation technologies, again, come from Afro-Indigenous lineage. This in particular, uh, the tomato was buried in sifted ash. Um, you can also you know, bury things in sifted sand. But there's uh, smoking, fermenting, drying methods that were brought over uh, with enslaved Africans and are used in the US. Does anyone here use raised beds? Why? Why use raised beds? Yep. Water control, erosion prevention. Easier to weed. Yeah, it's more convenient. The soil warms up faster. Why? Yeah, he said I'm aging. <laughs> they look pretty. Okay, all those things. Something I, I learned actually recently is that the um, neem leaves that are on this person's raised beds, these are yam amounts. But the neem leaves also are a repellent, a nematode repellent. So there's lots of ways to use raised beds. But the Ovambo people in what is now Namibia were the first, the first documentation we have of the use of raised beds. So we can thank black farmers as well for that technology. The work party. Volunteer days, right? Like you come over to my farm and help me out, and then I'm going to come to your farm and help you out. And you know, when you come visit me, I'm going to make sure there's good soup and some you know, good music playing. That comes out of the Dokpwe in West Africa. Uh, it's called the Kombit in Haiti. But these are very organized mutual aid societies. And labor was not traditionally done through a wage system. It was done through a mutual aid exchange system. Right? You're still tied by the bonds of obligation. Because if you don't show up to anyone else's work party, they're not going to show up to your work party. But the idea is a free exchange of labor to keep everybody's agriculture going. Does anyone here bank at a credit union as opposed to like a regular bank? Okay, I do too. The idea for the credit union was actually birthed out of what West African and Afro-Caribbean women were doing with their susus. So a susu is a lending society or a savings club where you have a certain amount of money that you need to put in every week or every month the most trusted elder woman in the community is called the Susuma, and she holds everybody's money, and she's not going to let anything happen to it. And then when it's your turn on a rotation, you can take out a grant or a loan so you can fix the thatch on your market stall or buy that new cow or you know, whatever you need to do. Um, and this idea became the birth of these lending societies and credit unions much later on. And of course, our spirituality, you know? I mean, many of you have heard me tell the story, but it's very important to me. You know, when I was living in Ghana, West Africa, as a young 20-something, snot-nosed kid who didn't really know what I was doing, I got a lot of lessons. And one of those lessons from the Queen Mothers was like, y'all in the United States who put a seed in the ground and you don't pray or sing or dance, pour libation or even say thank you to the earth, and then expect the seed to come up and give you something to eat, like, Nah, that's why you're all sick, right? <laughs> you are sick in the body, you are sick in the mind, you are sick in the spirit because you think the earth is a commodity and not a relative. So here we are at the farm looking a little bit the fool, but we are saying thank you. We're just saying thank you, right? And it's not that we as black people are frozen in time and it's like, well, if you go back to Cleopatra, black people contributed something, but now, you know, in new times, those seeds, were remembered by people in every generation once we came over to this continent. Right? There were people who remembered to pluck out the seeds and innovate and build upon that legacy. And so I'm just going to mention a few of them. For example, we have Tuskegee University in Alabama, right? which was created through self-help. Like People literally built the bricks on their own. And they were the very first extension agents in this whole country. So they realized that people couldn't afford even to leave their farms and come to the university for classes like this. So they decided, OK, we're going to have to go to them. They had a mule and a cart. Um, and they went out, and they found the most busted farms. They nursed the livestock back to health. They pruned the trees. They installed fencing. They did cover cropping, right? fixed up the farm with all the neighbors. And then that became the demonstration site. And then they go to the next county. Eventually, they got enough funding to buy a, a little vehicle, um, so they didn't have the mule and cart. But we can thank you know, Tuskegee for our extension agencies. Dr. George Washington Carver, also at Tuskegee. He was famous for the peanut. 
He made like a thousand peanut inventions. The reason he had to make a thousand peanut invention, inventions was because he convinced a whole lot of farmers to plant a lot of peanuts <laughs> and other legumes, like the black eyed pea, because legumes do what? Nitrogen. They nitrogen fix in combination with their best friend, rhizobial bacteria. In the root nodules, they actually pull the nitrogen down into the soil. And so he was healing all of these soils that were devastated by cotton monocropping. Uh, soils were completely depleted. And it takes a lot in the 1800s to convince a bunch of farmers to take their property out of cash crop and put it in legumes, which you're not even going to harvest most. You're going to like turn it in. But he was able to do that. He was able to raise up the first generation of regenerative farmers in the 1880s and 1890s. They were composting. They were cover cropping. They were pulling muck out from the swamps as mulch. Um, they were grazing their pigs under acorns in a silvopasture system. These are black farmers in the 1800s. Rodale in 1940. Right? So we really need to think about the origins of this whole situation, where it came from. A generation later, also at Tuskegee, Booker T. Watley. Right? Anyone ever heard of farm to table? Watley was like, this wholesale thing for small farmers is not going to work. I see the writing on the wall. We need to have direct farmer to consumer marketing. And I've got a few ideas. He's like, idea number one, make a newsletter and send it out so people feel connected. Like name your animals, right? Make people feel connected to the farm. Then there's going to be loyalty. Number two, invite people out to your farm to harvest fruits and vegetables. You're going to call it pick your own, right? Idea number three, offer memberships. Uh, we'll call it a clientele membership club. If they join your farm and they pay up front, they're going to get wholesale prices and a weekly box of anything that's delivered. That sounds like anything? CSA. So again, people thought he was nuts. Like, these small farms are just going to die out. He said they're not going to die out because we're going to have a new marketing strategy. The whole idea of land trusts. Land trusts are sort of like how you get white man's law to do collective ownership of land. right? Because in indigenous communities, we always had collective stewardship of land, not even ownership. But you know, Shirley Sherrod and Charles Sherrod, they went all around the world trying to study land tenure because they wanted to crack this nut of how do we own it together and came up with the idea of the community land trust, which essentially separates the land ownership rights from the building rights. It's a little technically complicated. But they started new communities in 1969 in Albany, Georgia with 6,000 acres. They just celebrated their 50th anniversary of 500 families collectively stewarding this land. Right? Fannie Lou Hamer. Co-ops, right? Um, even before Fannie Lou Hamer in 1910, there's a whole book about black co-ops um, that you all should check out if you're interested in the history of co-ops. But Fannie Lou Hamer was very concerned because what was happening during the 1960s is that sh black sharecroppers who registered to vote, the next day they would get a notice that they'd lost their jobs and their home. They were kicked off of the plantation. And so we have all these homeless people because essentially they decided to exercise their constitutional right to vote. So she wasn't going to take that lying down, like no how, no way. So she's like, what, what am I going to do? I think what I'm going to do is figure out how to create a co-op of all of these displaced people. It was called Freedom Farms. So 70 displaced sharecroppers came to collectively own this co-op to produce vegetables. And they made enough money in those initial years that they could cover scholarships for their members, burial fees for their members. Um, they had a pig lending bank, so uh, you could borrow a pregnant livestock, you know, and then you get some babies and then you give it back to the bank. Heifer Project thought that was a good idea. Took that on. Um, food hubs, right? We can thank actually the black church for the idea of food hubs in the South. They used to just call them church sheds. Fancy name, but essentially all the farmers, whatever produce they couldn't sell in their local markets, they bring it to church. They combine it. And then once they have enough melons to fill a truck, they fill that truck and send it up to Chicago, or they fill that truck and send it to a nearby town, right? Um, and Philip and Dorothy Barker actually won an award recently for their role in, at Operation Spring Plant in taking the, the concept of the food hub to the next level. Free breakfast. Who's that? Black Panther, Black Panther Party. So right now in this nation, we know we have a free breakfast program in the schools. We have a free lunch program in the schools. Uh, we have summer meals. This really came out of the Black Panthers um, and other black nationalists 
organizers um, during the 1960s who said, you know, if we're going to get free, first we have to focus on our survival programs because if we don't have food in our bellies, if we can't get to our medical appointments, if we don't have safe housing, there's only so far we can go politically. So we need to be both taking care of basic needs and we also need to be organizing for a just future. And then finally, perhaps my favorite because it's, it's a recent one, is um, well, I'll tell you a quick story about why this is relevant. My daughter, Nishima, who is now almost 17, when she was one years old, we were living in Worcester, Massachusetts, doing urban farming. And of course, you know, like any farm mom, I'm like bringing my baby along with me. She's like planting and playing in the dirt and playing with worms. Well, I take her to her one year appointment and she's got lead poisoning. Not from our house, from the gardens. She has lead poisoning. And, um, you know, of course, we did everything we needed to do to take care of her. But I'm not only thinking about my child, I'm thinking about all these children across the city, their playgrounds, their schoolyards, their gardens. So I started going around testing the soils. And I was finding, you know, the EPA sets the level, level at 400 ppm for safety. I was seeing 11,000 ppm. That's super fun site level. And what we ended up doing is um, testing different methods to heal the soil. And the most effective one uses an African flower called the pelargonium or scented geranium. It's a bioaccumulator. It sucks lead out of the soil so you can move it and put the lead in a safe place. And over a couple of years of doing the phytoremediation, the soil is healed. Uh, we formed a youth co-op called the Toxic Soil Busters, got a contract from the city to get them paid to like go out in their hazmat suits and clean up the city. So it's now safe to garden in Worcester, Massachusetts, if you ever want to do that. And it didn't end there, right? There's like mad people, including folks in this room, who are continuing that legacy of remembering the seeds um, in our hair. But the thing is that if black farmers like contributed so much to regenerative farming and continue to contribute so much, like why aren't we flourishing? Why aren't we flourishing? Why are we only 1% of the nation's farmers? Why do we have almost no land? Why aren't we accessing markets? And I'm going to put forth that there's five basic issues that we're dealing with and that we can solve. So issue number one that black farmers is dealing with is access to land. And that's because part of the DNA of this country was to steal the land from indigenous people, but not just from indigenous people, then to steal it again from communities of color who managed to access the land. Right? Look at in Japanese internment and how many Japanese farmers lost their land during World War II. Right? Look at how black farmers in 1910 accumulated almost 16 million acres of land and almost all of it is gone because the white caps, the Ku Klux Klan and the White Citizens Council burned down their houses for the audacity of not being sharecroppers anymore and drove them north. That was the Great Migration. Because the federal government, the USDA, didn't give loans to black farmers, so much so that the Federal Commission of Civil Rights said that the USDA was the number one cause of the decline of the black farmer. And so much so that those black farmers sued the government in 1999 and won a settlement, the largest in history, a civil rights settlement in history, because of that discrimination. Right, right now in this country, over 98% of the arable land is owned by European heritage people. Not an accident. Right? The second thing we're dealing with is that the DNA of this country's food system is also rooted in exploiting labor. You know, the very foundation of the U.S. agricultural system is forced, unpaid uh, labor of enslaved Africans in bondage, right? But then even after the Emancipation Proclamation, the nation went on to use other means to make sure it didn't have to pay for the labor, whether that's convict leasing. Convict leasing is when you make up a bunch of laws to get a lot of people in prison and then you rent them back to the farms. That's actually very active right now in 2020. By the way, convict leasing, black men harvesting on plantations because of a migrant labor shortage. Um, you have the issue of, you know, our labor laws themselves don't include farm workers. The Fair Labor Standards Act and the National Labor Relations Act don't include farm workers or domestic workers, which has a very race-based history. 85% of the labor done on farms is Hispanic or Latino, Latinx, um, yet only about 2.5% of farms are managed by that population. So we have a big labor issue that's a barrier. And it's interesting that you mentioned Wendell Berry because I was not, we didn't talk. But I think there's a deep connection between the way we think about labor and the way we think about the earth. So I'm just going to read this quote from Wendell Berry. 
It says the white man, preoccupied with the abstractions of the economic exploitation and ownership of the land, necessarily has lived on the country as a destructive force, an ecological catastrophe, because he assigned the hand labor and in that the possibility of intimate knowledge of the lands to a people he considered racially inferior. In thus debasing labor, he destroyed the possibility of meaningful contact with the earth. He was literally blinded by his presuppositions and prejudices. Because he did not know the land, it was inevitable that he would squander its natural bounty, deplete its richness, corrupt and pollute it, or destroy it altogether. The history of the white man's use of the earth in America is a scandal. Wendell Berry. Like you, I was like, Wendell Berry said that? <laughs> Damn, okay, I'm gonna go read the rest of the book. <laughs> and again, I'm not saying like a whole group of people's bad, and it's not about guilt, but it's really about looking at what are the priorities of a society, right? And so if a cultural priority is around greed or exploitation, and we see that in the very founding of this country with Manifest Destiny, like anywhere that a colonizer puts down a flag, they can go ahead and take all the resources and kick the people off. We gotta really question that DNA and work to mutate it for the positive. Because what we have now is this European agricultural system, which is completely trashing the planet. It's like the number one driver of greenhouse gas emissions, the number one driver of biodiversity loss, the number one driver of water withdrawals. And it's not that we don't know how to farm right. We do, but those technologies are either ignored they're made into like niche market specialty things, or they're appropriated. Right. And then the final, or sorry, the um, next issue that we're dealing with is on the consumer side. We don't got any food to eat in our communities, y'all. And it's not because we don't know how to eat, or we don't know how to cook, or we don't want to eat good food. It's because a whole history of housing discrimination and exclusion has led to food apartheid, where certain zip codes you can get your Trader Joe's, your Whole Foods, and your farmer's markets, and other zip codes, you get KFC and the liquor store with candy bars. Dollar store, exactly. And that is why we have a disproportionate disease burden in our communities of diabetes, heart disease, and kidney failure in black and brown communities. That's why we have disproportionate hunger in our communities. And I don't know about y'all, but when I'm hungry or sick, I'm not trying to go down and talk to my elected representative about labor laws or land access, right? I'm really focused on my own survival. And so there's a way that food can either be used as a weapon to keep a population down or as medicine to heal and empower a population. Right? And then the final thing that we're, we're dealing with, and again, I think we can solve all these problems, is trauma. You know, Chris Bolden Newsom, who's a, a farmer not far away and a friend of mine, he said land was the scene of the crime but I would add she was not actually the criminal. But because so much harm happened on the land from slavery to sharecropping to convict leasing to forced expulsions to house burnings to you know, farm worker exploitation, all those things happened on the land. I will tell you that almost every young person who comes to the farm, even though they are generations removed from that, is like, y'all slaves? Y'all bending over, right? And that trauma needs to be healed for us to reclaim a dignified relationship with the earth. And part of its like reclamation is telling the true story of how our connection to land is not circumscribed by those oppressions, but reaches back to Cleopatra and the Obambo people and raised beds and polycultures and all of that noble history. So there is like a what you can do, like takeaway, because I think it is all of our responsibility to pay respects to the black agrarian tradition and to carry on the seed. And Fundamentally, what it comes down to is how do we take the resources that we have and transfer them into organizations and collectives that are led by the people impacted by these harms, right? If I want to work on Islamophobia, who are the experts on that issue who I should listen to about what needs to be done? The Muslim community. If I want to work on um, the way PTSD is impacting the veterans community, who are the experts who I should listen to, pay attention to, the veterans community. If I want to work on racism and injustice in the food system, who are the experts? Black and brown farmers and black and brown consumers, right? And so the question is not like, how do I like, figure out how to take what I know and sort of dump it on a community and like pull them along into my project, right? That's not really the question. The question is, do I have time money, land, connections with funders, resources, a platform, power, 
my job? Like, do I have things that I can literally give away? Because there is a disproportionate distribution of resources. You know, like, a white child born today in this country will take its first breath on average 16 times wealthier than a black baby born in this country today. Not because the white child like, did a bunch of like, push-ups in the womb and was like, <laughs> really like, working hard. right? It's because wealth is inherited and it's been building on a legacy of stealing land and labor from people. And so it's like, how do we give it back? And there's a whole list of like, more detailed action steps about that and like, laws we need to pass on our website that you should definitely check out. But there's, you know, I feel like everybody could give 10 hours a year. You know, everyone could give 10 hours a year towards justice at least. So that's something to think about. Something to think about is like, what seed are you planting for the future? So to close, I want to invite everyone to read my, one of my favorite poems together with me. We'll do it all together in unison. I think this will work. All right, y'all ready? Breathe in. Pardon me if when I want to tell the story of my life, it's the land I talk about. This is the land. It grows in your blood and you grow. If it dies in your blood, you die out. Pablo Neruda. Okay. So y'all are amazing. You should definitely be in touch, get involved. Um, if you do want a book, and the book has all this, plus how to farm, plus like the story of Soul Fire, all the proceeds from our books go to the Black Farmer Fund of New York, so you don't even have to feel like guilty or anything. And there's a bunch of pre-signed ones that you could get right now in like the 10 minutes you have before your next workshop, or I can sign for you at, um, oh, I wrote it down. I can sign for you during lunch also, um, if you want. So hopefully you should get a book. Thanks, everyone. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>